fascinating panel now coming up. The idea was to hear a lot from the, the front, uh, hear what's happening in Ukraine directly, hear about the direct impact on the lives of the Ukrainians um, and, and what, what things are looking like there. But this part of what we were interested in is that this, is a, 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 this has had a huge global effect. It certainly had a huge regional effect. And these are both positive and, and negative. Um, just the, as um, our minister from Poland mentioned, you know, it's very heartwarming to see people welcome refugees into their homes. It's very heartwarming to see what our people are doing here in Connecticut to welcome people into their homes and how they help. Um, but of course, you know, this is a, a step beyond even what would normally be expected. And these are hardships that these people are enduring and that are hardships on the economies, the, the neighboring communities. And so we wanted to hear a bit about how it's impacting the region. Um, so our next panel, that was all as a way to get people to sit down. I really had nothing useful to say. Um, but I, yeah, as a professor, we we're paid to pull this off, right? Um, so with that, let me turn it to our round table. Um, gentlemen, if I would ask, make sure the on your mics, there's a button on the back. Pull, make sure it's pulled up. And please speak into the microphones as best as you can. And I will turn it over to our moderator. To moderate a round table, we would like question and answer again. We'll try and keep it for the end. Professor Jacek Chaputovic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this panel will be on responses uh, from the region to the crisis, to the war in Ukraine. We have um, a group of diplomats representing these countries uh, in the United States and also a, an expert from Hungary. But let me ask first, um, a Romanian expo, uh, response to the crisis from Colonel um, Feruta, uh, Romanian ambassador to the United uh, Nations, please. Ambassador Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Professor Chaputovic. Um, coming from New York after a week that actually was dignifying for the response that the international community provides to this Russian aggression, <coughs> and meeting you at an event organized by the Central uh, European Institute, and I'm very grateful to our Honorary Consul to, uh, to invite me to this event and to you uh, as well to the organizers. I would say it's quite fulfilling because it, it provides also a chance to look at this, war, at this aggression, unjust and unprovoked, uh, from a multi-dimensional um, you know, point, point of view. <coughs> we did have on the 22nd in New York a full day event on human rights violations in Ukraine. And it's very painful, I have to say, as a diplomat, not only for myself, but for all of us, to sit in a large room full of people, not only diplomats, but also NGOs and victims and Ukrainian defenders, describing the horrors they had to get through. And um, it, it's also a moment when we have to decide to simply regroup ourselves and to fight the injustice and to push back and to say that enough is enough indeed. And then we continue on the 23rd of February on Thursday with an important message from the international community in the General Assembly adopting a resolution that again one year after the aggression started the international community condemned the aggression and asked Russia to withdraw its forces. And then yesterday there was a Security Council meeting on the same occasion and the answer was again as strong as before. The unwavering commitment of the international community to defend the principles and the foundation that we have created after the Second World War. I welcome the presence of the US veterans here simply because they know exactly how difficult it is to defend what we sometimes tend to take for granted, 
and nothing can be taken for granted. And that's a painful reminder. And what we do as Romania, <coughs> we don't do it in isolation. That's exactly how it is supposed to happen within the European Union, within NATO, within the UN, to take collective action and measure to defend um, the rules-based order, to support Ukraine, and actually to bring that war to a stop by Russia's withdrawal from, from Ukraine. In Romania, I think we've been, um, and I think all of our countries are being faced with many numbers and statistics. How many refugees, um, what is the impact, how many entered, how many exited. We, we had about 3.5 million Ukrainians entering Romania since um, uh, last year, in one year time. Um, several hundreds of thousands of them are still in Romania. If I'm looking at the, you know, one particular figure is very blatant. Out of the 3.5 million, 700,000 are children. 700,000. And we've been seeing as a country that is neighboring Ukraine with the largest land border, we've been seeing not only numbers, we've been seeing tragedies and every number brings and represents a personal drama, a personal tragedy. And that's actually quite important to keep in mind, to remind ourselves that, for example, while it is very cold outside here, we have options. But there are many people outside or indoor in Ukraine without probably heating because of the Russian destruction of the critical infrastructure. And we've been welcoming many Ukrainians. There are two stories that stuck with my mind, and one of them I, I recalled um, at the event on the 22nd. Um, there was one child making his way, 10 years old boy, his way to Romania from the Odessa region by foot. He walked several hundred kilometers from the Odessa region to cross Romania through the Galats um, port with a backpack, alone, unaccompanied. And the second one, which is also a story of hope and optimism, is one of the Ukrainian tennis players that crossed the border, leaving her parents behind in Ukraine, Marta Kostyuk, crossing the border through the same uh, part of Romania, leaving the parents be behind, as I said, and that later on, came to partner with a Romanian tennis player just recently, several weeks ago, and winning many games and matches in tennis tournaments in WTA. Why it's a story of hope? Because this happened last June when she came to Romania and she apparently she couldn't see the hope in front of her. And now, of course, she managed to regroup herself, to regain strength, and actually to show what the Ukrainian people are capable of. And in Romania, of course, we'll continue to support every Ukrainian. We made, this is not, not a government commitment. It's, it's a commitment by the society, by the individuals. Um, I came to the UN in September before that I was in Bucharest as Deputy Foreign Minister, and while working with my you know, daughter in the park. We, we, we would play with Ukrainian children that were with their mothers, not the full family, of course. And that's why I'm talking about the drama and the personal tragedies that come with that. And those children, we've been doing our best actually to put them through school and to alleviate the trauma and the suffering. And we continue to do, to do that. So that's the humanitarian dimension. And um, I may also add on this uh, part as, as well the the efforts that we've been doing to support uh, Ukraine, uh, exporting Ukrainian grain uh, through uh, to different parts of the world, to the poorest of the nations, to the global south, as we call it. And our port of Constanza, all of a sudden, from uh, March last year, when many countries in the world were complaining about lack of food or increased prices, we were helping Ukraine to, um, to send a positive message to the world that while Ukraine is continuing fighting for its own 
future and for its own destiny, it also helps others. Um, I'm not going to develop all of the aspects and I also leave some for the Q&A and I also leave it to, to, my, to my colleagues as well. There is one particular dimension that we all have to keep in mind. We are trying to fight injustice. We are trying to send a message that this aggression cannot be tolerated. And including in this room, like any other meeting rooms that I've seen for the past year, we have many generations of individuals that probably have not seen war. We, we did not know how war would look like. We were not faced directly with the war. And yet we are. And, and of course, such an aggression should not go unpunished. The atrocities should not go unpunished. The human rights violations, the unspeakable and the unimaginable should not go unpunished. And that's where Romania also plays an important role in trying to create a framework conducive to, to justice, to make those who uh, committed those crimes to pay for them. So we've been, of course, we are supporting Ukraine in the International Court of Justice uh, track. We are supporting the International Criminal Court to uh, advance with its investigations with experts and financially as well. And we are also supporting with a, a large number of countries, more and more we hope, the creation of a spe special tribunal for the crime of aggression. So justice is important. And the only way we can fight just injustice is through enforcing justice wherever it is possible. So these are just few of the uh, snapshots I wanted to provide for the beginning of our conversation and um, happy to, um, uh, to contribute further. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador, for bringing in not only um, Romanian perspective, it's very important uh, the role of the country, uh, Black Sea port exporting grain it, and refugees um, affected uh, um, uh, f from, from that war, but also for bringing in this international perspective of the United Nations and this rule of law perspective, responsibility, and just think uh, uh, atrocities should not go unpunished, and the role of international uh, system, um, uh, international courts, criminal court. Thank you for that. Now I will uh, give the floor to uh, Consul General of the Republic of Poland in New York, Adrian Kubicki. Thank you very much. Uh, on a very personal note, I feel very privileged because Professor Czaputowicz as a foreign minister a few years back actually accepted, signed my appointment as a consul general uh, of Poland to New York City. So uh, I think it's appropriate where at the university, I feel a little bit like on the exam now. I <laughs> uh, hope I only give a good answers. Uh, and also Professor Czaputowicz uh, gave to all of you um, a pretty good outlook of how that help and how that engagement involvement of Poland and Polish people looked throughout this year since we marked this grim uh, one year anniversary of, of Russia's invasion. Um, I think that the solidarity and unity is something that uh, have become a trademark uh, of Poland and Polish people over this passing year. Uh, from the day one when this invasion started, uh, people started to um, lining up towards uh, the border of Poland. It was for them a very natural direction. Um, and we started this mass acceptance of, uh, of those people into our country. And frankly speaking, from a person who is still very much directly connected to Poland, I don't think I know a single person that hasn't been involved this way or another in providing different forms of assistance to Ukraine. Many people were, were traveling back and forth to the Ukrainian border, accepting Ukrainians to their households for undefined amount of time, uh, providing them with all means uh, of, uh, of, of help what they needed as a first uh, response. Uh, so this was something beautiful, and I think um, that generosity 
and open hearts of Polish people became uh, something very n well known across the globe, also here in the United States uh, of America. I think the reason why, that this is very often questioned, uh, w why Polish people decided to um, uh, actually react that way, which is very uh, extraordinary. I think the reason is that Poland and Polish people have, have a very different and, and very appropriate um, rightful understanding of Russia and of the Russian uh, objectives. Um, and I think that we understand the, the seriousness of the threat that Russia has created for Ukraine and for the stability of the entire region and probably entire globe. And I think that since, since we have this understanding, we treated that from the very beginning not only as uh, something uh, something isolated or, or isolated Ukrainian problem, but something that uh, from the day one um, or even before this invasion started, as Professor Czaputowicz pointed out to us, to Polish people, uh, we have understanding that it has started actually many years ago, ma many years before. Uh, so I think that the re this reaction seemed very na natural. Uh, but also state of Poland, Polish administration played a significant role uh, in setting up completely new blueprint, frankly speaking, uh, in terms of how to handle refugee crisis. Instead of locking those refugees into uh, refugee camps of any sort, um, uh, the idea was different, is to give th those people dignity and help them to move on with their lives uh, on the normal basis to the extent um, it's, it was possible, obviously, given the, uh, what, what was happening uh, in their country. So, so granting those people, allowing those people to obtain something that is equivalent of social security number, PESEL, called in Polish, uh, was something that gave them access to Polish health system, healthcare, uh, all social programs, pretty much on very similar basis to Polish uh, citizens. And uh, we have accepted uh, to the date over 250,000 children into Polish schools uh, and uh, kindergartens. Um, uh, they are able to um, uh, take lessons and to learn um, uh, being part of this education um, and since 90, over 90% 90 of, of this immigration of these refugees are women with children, that gives uh, those women chance to work and they can work legally um, and they can sign up uh, for, for jobs and this is also very helpful from, from that perspective. Uh, so they can uh, they can uh, regain that dignity. Uh, what is very interesting about Ukrainians, um, uh, those people never tend to use this as an opportunity for economic migration. This is why from over 9 million to the date, 9 million people who crossed the border with Poland f from Ukraine, the vast majority decided to go back to Ukraine as soon as possible because I think that they have this understanding that men are fighting there uh, in the battlefield, but country must be run in all the different aspects. Uh, there, are, there must be uh, restaurants uh, in operations, infrastructures must run. They try to keep normality of life in their country, and this is something that w w what I think is beautiful. But many of those people travel back and forth, and we keep our borders uh, very much open for them, and also given the dynamics of the war, we might expect maybe, um, hopefully not, but uh, we hear from time to time of, of different chapters, different uh, phase of this invasion. We must be constantly, continuously open to accommodate them. Uh, with the, all of that being said, I think it wouldn't be possible with the international efforts and collaboration between the countries, particularly between the European countries, uh, in different aspects of this migration crisis. Uh, obviously, there are uh, certain vulnerable groups like children, like orphans in particular, uh, elderly people who constitute over 6% of, of those uh, refugees uh, who came to Poland. So this is a lot of effort and a lot of collaboration also uh, with the United States of America. Um, uh, New York was probably uh, the largest city in terms of number of refugees coming to the United States. I know Connecticut also accepted uh, a significant number of them. Uh, th to my previous point, uh, we shouldn't expect mass migration to the United States since they want to still remain attached to their country, but still uh, it is an effort and we are also very happy to share our experience 
with the refugees, uh, which might eventually also help to solve some of the internal American um, refugee problems. So this is the refugee part of the story. Uh, another help that had been provided um, is obviously, uh, famously, the military support of Poland. Poland was at the very for forefront of the coalition. Um, uh, we were very vocal of what Ukrainians need, that the relation that has been established between Polish administration and Ukrainian administration helps us to create this transmission path uh, of certain requests from Ukraine. Uh, and we try to translate it to some of our p partners uh, to, to say it in a diplomatic manner. Some of them are uh, more hesitant in terms of, uh, of opening for new uh, weaponry or different means that, that Ukrainians need. But uh, luckily, uh, Poland is being very vocal on the international uh, forum and, and eventually we achieve our goals. Uh, to the date, as Professor Czaputowicz mentioned that as well, uh, yesterday actually it was the first day when the first Polish Leopard tanks were delivered to Ukraine. And this is not only an individual isolated Polish effort, but thanks to uh, also uh, our activity, um, there are other countries um, that will de de deliver uh, this weaponry to Ukraine. But this is also n not only about tanks. Poland provided also Soviet, post-Soviet tanks uh, earlier, over 260 of them. Other weaponry, including launchers, ma missiles, anti-missiles, uh, drones, uh, but pretty much everything what Ukraine could possibly need uh, in order to defend themselves. Uh, we spent on that over 3 billion euros, uh, which constitutes over 1.5 Polish GDP, just to give you the idea uh, of, um, of the weight of the, the, the help that is imposed on Poland. But on top of that, we also understand that we will not achieve those goals working alone, and we understand the significance of Na NATO in all of that. Uh, Poland dedicated uh, itself, uh, uh, committed uh, uh, itself this year to dedicate 4% uh, of our GDP to our military spending because we understand that uh, our security, uh, security of our region is, is instrumental in terms of uh, keep, uh, keeping the global stability. But we also expect uh, similar moves and, and involvement and, in, uh, and, uh, and engagement from our partners. Uh, this is why one of the topics that have been brought up uh, during the President Biden's visit to Poland was to set up, establish, um, finally, permanent base uh, of NATO <coughs> US troops in Poland to protect the eastern flank of NATO. My final statement um, will be this. I think that the epicenter of global stability and global security shifted, and it's definitely um, uh, where the eastern flank of NATO is. And I think that the time is up to take um, uh, bold steps and decisions in terms of uh, uh, taking care of also of our security. And I think this is in the interest of not only NATO, but also uh, Ukraine. Needless to say, uh, alike Rom Romania, Poland will stand with Ukraine and will continue um, uh, our s we will continue our support support to Ukraine and to Ukrainian people for as long as it takes. Quoting President Biden's remarks um, from Warsaw. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Council General, I'm looking at the audience as a jury. I like to inform you that you have passed an exam. It was a good choice to sign uh, uh, your position here. Now, um, the voice from Hungary, Viktor Marsai, research director from Migration Research Institute from Budapest. Please, what's your uh, response, Hungarian response to the crisis? Thank you, thank you, Excellency, and uh, thank you all of us, uh, and thank you for inviting me for the uh, panel. Uh, well, uh, actually, I could just continue the, the, the uh, saying the, of my uh, the previous speakers in many aspects what Hungary uh, did during the uh, this one year of uh, the Ukrainian refugee crisis, uh, and how Hungary is similar front frontline state uh, in this crisis, like Ukraine and Romania, joined to open its border for the. Uh, fleeing Ukrainian people uh, to uh, have a safe place, uh, escaping from the uh, horrors of uh, war. You know, Hungary is uh, comparing with the United States, but even with uh, Poland, this is a much smaller country with uh, 9.8 million 
uh, citizens. So until uh, today's uh, 2.2 million Ukrainian people arrived in uh, Hungary. Most of them left the country, but you can uh, compare that almost one quarter of the total population of, the, of Hungary has arrived from Ukraine. It's very important uh, thing uh, and topic which was, uh, which haven't been mentioned I think during this uh, even today that not only Ukrainian people fleeing from the war from Ukraine but also third world uh, citizens, a lot of students, employees of different companies, multinational companies from Kyiv, Odessa and other uh, places and hundreds of thousands of these people also escaped uh, from the war tens of thousands across uh, Hungary and the Hungarian government uh, and NGOs provided them shelter and a safe pass uh, in many cases back to the third countries. Just uh, uh, 12,000 Indian people uh, traveled back uh, across uh, Budapest airport and uh, uh, hundreds of different students who arrived, both, uh, both Ukrainian and third world citizens, get the possibilities in different uh, Hungarian universities to continue their uh, studies there. I, I think in the last uh, 30 years, it was the first occasion, for example, but when Hungary and Somalia had official diplomatic exchange uh, when the uh, Somalian foreign minister asked, uh, sorry, uh, thanks for the, the Hungarian counterpart that uh, hundreds of Somali students were sheltered in, uh, within Budapest. Uh, similarly, like Poland and Romania, it was also it's uh, excellent to feel and see that how the Hungarian society, both the government and the people, NGOs, everybody uh, came together to, to help the, the arriving Ukrainian people since the, the moment that they uh, re uh, reached uh, Hungary. Uh, fortunately, it's, uh, it helped a lot that uh, thanks to the uh, EU-Ukraine agreement by biometric passport, it was very easy. To, to come into the uh, Schengen area, but also for third world citizens and Ukrainian people who didn't have this biometric passport. Actually, the, the entrance, actually almost all, all, all EU countries was relatively uh, easy. Um, until now, uh, the people who claim temporary protection uh, within Hungary is uh, comparing, for example, with Poland and or Germany or Czech Republic is relatively limited, uh, 36,000 people. Although, according to different estimations and government statistics, between uh, 150 200,000 Ukrainian people uh, stayed within uh, Hungary. The reason why they uh, 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 didn't ask temporary protection is mainly because they can simply uh, stay in Hungary without uh, this uh, special status, or they are dual citizens, or they were get job very easily in the, uh, the Hungarian labor market. And another reason is that uh, is mainly the, the challenges of, of the language. Uh, the diaspora issue is very, very important. Uh, for example, in Poland before the war, if I'm not mistaken, between 1, 1.5 million Ukrainian people have already lived. Many of them arrived after uh, 2014. So there were huge uh, Ukrainian communities who could uh, and can help in the integration. Uh, the Hungarian government uh, opened the schools for the, uh, Hungary, uh, for the Ukrainian children and, and provide uh, in, uh, Hungarian standards a high uh, support for each kid who uh, is coming for, uh, to the schools. But the, the biggest problem uh, discussing with both the schools as a, and the NGOs is actually the, the language challenges. Uh, most of the Ukrainian uh, children coming speaking only uh, Ukrainian. Of course, not Hungarian, but even uh, who's speaking in German or, or English, which uh, would make much easier to integrate them to the uh, Hungarian education system is a, is a huge challenge. And actually, perhaps this is the biggest problem currently, uh, why which the, both the NGOs and the government are uh, facing uh, during the integration of these uh, communities. And what we can uh, also see that uh, Beside my microphone is over. Uh, time's up, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other microphone, yeah. That's okay. So uh, that uh, as uh, as the time is passing, the 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 strategies of the uh, of the refugees is also uh, shifting, and I think it's a it's a key point, also, ladies and gentlemen, which uh, we should keep in our mind. The uh, UNHCR, the uh, UN Refugee uh, Agency conducting a regular surveys among the people who arrived uh, from Ukraine that what's their long-term uh, intention. 
And it's also a key issue in the integration process and how they can uh, spend their months or years in, in Europe because it's evident from the UN uh, ACR surveys that the overwhelming majority of the right people want to go back uh, home when the war is over. And, but at this point, of course, they not, and uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, also the Ukrainian government, of course, during this winter season, encouraged them to stay in Europe. But it's a huge dilemma, and I think we should underline it, that as the time is passing, and, and these people integrating more and more to European society, it's a huge risk what will happen if, uh, and we hope uh, sooner than later, as soon as possible, but uh, the, the current perspectives are well, not so promising that how they can return or whether they want to return to their home countries, to Ukraine, to, to build up after this uh, horrible war. Because what uh, the academics and the expert experience, for example, in the, the Syrian refugee crisis, is that after two, three years when uh, the uh, families spending their uh, life in a foreign country, their kids are involved into an other education system, uh, into an other social system. Uh, the, the adults uh, uh, have found jobs there and they, they build up their ex existence. After two, three or four years, it, uh, it raises a big question whether they will return to their home countries. And I think it's a, it's a huge uh, challenge or even we can say, I think, a threat for Ukraine because without the Ukrainian population, and it was also mentioned by the, the Ukrainian member of parliament, it, it, it would be a challenge to build up this country after the war. So I think I conclude now, and of course we are open for questions. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. So we had uh, responses from all three uh, frontline countries responses to the crisis, mainly refugee crisis. Do we have time for questions? We have questions from the floor as well. Um, we've got the two microphones set. I see already somebody starting to the first tap and make sure it's on. Oh, he's an expert now. Test. Test. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you all gentlemen for coming. Um, I'm from uh, St. Michael's Church in New Haven and we, uh, we formed a uh, group that is providing support to Ukraine and at this point we've shipped over five and a half million dollars worth of materials in eight different containers and we have three more containers pending right now. Mm. What's interesting is the parish only has 90 some odd members in the parish, 15 members that are night local Knights of Columbus that belong to the parish, and the uh, American Ukrainian Post, which is also a very uh, veterans post, which is a very small group. And we have a tremendous amount of volunteers from all races and nationalities. Uh, in terms of the question I have, since this is a, a refugee uh, part of the conversation, uh, we get all kinds of reports that Russia has kidnapped up to 2.8 million Ukrainian civilians and hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian children. And I wonder if you could address the reality of this really is happening and what can be done to bring the Ukrainians that have been kidnapped back to where they belong. Thank you. Let me start since this seems to be the easy, easy, easy question. Uh, the, uh, I, I just, of, co of course, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I think it all depends on, uh, first of all, at this present moment, the willingness of Russia to collaborate with the exchange uh, of some of the people who are involuntarily displaced um, uh, to Russia, including the most vulnerable uh, Ukrainian children. It's horrific. Um, if we're not talking about the perspective on the ongoing war, but the aftermath and the ultimate uh, Russia uh, loss, uh, this is something that should also be imposed, investigated, and enforced. 
but I think that from our perspective, we learned that this is of a, a high priority for Ukraine and Ukrainians, that they really want to see their children back. And I think that uh, speaking of uh, children being kidnapped uh, into Russia is something of, of probably um, uh, the highest difficulty. Uh, also, working with Poland, with other countries of Europe, with the United States of America, there are a lot of issues that have to be addressed and, and is addressed um, uh, throughout the process in terms of how to take care of Ukrainian children. Sometimes we would like to see Ukrainians being a little bit more flexible. Uh, I can give you the example of the orphanages that are being displaced. Um, uh, the average orphanage in Ukraine uh, consists of 100, sometimes up to 200 children. And one of the demands of the Ukrainian side is that we don't split those gr groups. First of all, we know that this is very difficult to find logistically in, in terms of infrastructure, facilities to accept those children. But also we know from our experience that it's better experience and better quality of care if, if we create smaller groups. So this is one of the area areas that we wanted to, uh, we wanted to discuss with, with, with Ukrainian side and we found some solutions. Uh, also there is this rule that uh, Ukrainians do not allow or stop allowing adoptions. Uh, which is something that I understand is very uh, very much of an interest from Americans. Many people approach us and ask what can we do to, to facilitate the process of uh, adoption. There is a lot, a lot of interest here in America from people who wanted to, to take basically Ukrainian children to their houses. Uh, Ukrainians are very strict in terms of, uh, of, of, of that aspect and um, as much as we would like to work with them on maybe losing up on some of these restrictions, we must understand, and actually Poland has a, probably the best understanding given our history, why they want to keep an eye and track their children. Eventually th this will be the generation of people who will rebuild Ukraine. So, so this is very sensitive and it has to be worked out. In terms of crimes, uh, in terms of uh, human trafficking, unfortunately when the war started, there were many different attempts uh, of foreign, foreign of many different uh, nationalities coming to the border, trying to take advantage also uh, on, on the children um, uh, on the border. And there were many attempts of, of kidnapping. And I have to say that we stood up to that uh, challenge as well as international community. Uh, uh, p Polish uh, different services and agencies uh, acted to that very promptly and together with our partners from Europe and from elsewhere. Uh, we actually put stop on that. We were successful on, on stopping that, that these proceedings, um, very awful proceedings. Uh, so this is a very sensi sensitive subject and I don't think there is, uh, there is a, s a simple answer to that. I can promise on behalf of my country that we will do uh, whatever is possible, uh, that the people responsible for war crimes and all other crimes associated uh, um, uh, with this war uh, will be brought to justice. You know, Poland spent last 300 years of our history, from, from, from 300 years of our history to 250 years, Poland spent under Russian occupation in different forms. So I can assure you that, that my government and Polish people will be very, very strict about, uh, about bringing uh, back the justice and bringing children and other kidnapped people back to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I, I think that's a very key point that you raised, sir. And um, it shows exactly the brutality and the inhuman you know, facet of, of this Russian aggression. I've been raising this point uh, two days ago at the high-level event on human rights violations in, in New York. Kidnapping as a state policy should not be tolerated. And there should be no, you, you know, there should be accountability for that. The children of Ukraine should go back to Ukraine and should return to Ukraine. <coughs> and I think we as governments, we will do whatever it takes to keep that issue on the agenda, but I think it's also important that, that you yourself and all of us um, point to the, uh, you know, to the uh, unacceptability of such measure, and this should not be tolerated. And um, I, I think we can all provide the answer, and through the accountability efforts, through the justice framework that we want to create, those children should be returned to, to Ukraine. And it was quite 
telling, you know, looking at the beginning of this week, there was this parade the concert and the, in Moscow. Apparently, some of the children kidnapped from Ukraine were paraded in front of the, you know, the, the large group of people. And that's beyond cynical. That's uh, completely, you know, um, um, it's more than inhumane. I, I have no words to describe that. Thank you. Victor. Dalia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, just uh, one positive and a negative issue. Uh, at the beginning of the war, when the, the refugees arrived to Hungary at the border region, some, let's say we call them jackals, appeared, of course, who offered uh, cheap transportation for the refugees uh, to Budapest or other European capitals. As actually it happened also in the, the migration crisis 2015, uh, when taxi drivers offer, I don't know, for 1,000 or 2,000 euro to, to bring the people to, to Vienna or other European capital. But actually it was, uh, was stopped very, very soon. And mainly interesting, not by the authorities who, who tried it, but they were uh, overburdened by the number of arrivals, but NGOs and, and the public who went to the drivers and tell them that it's high time to, to go very, uh, very far from the, the scene. So it was uh, not a real big problem. Uh, and it's not a real, real really big issue, I think, in the Hungary and the, and the Ukrainian refugees in, in Hungary. But I think besides the, the, the children, I think it's important to emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, that what's going on these uh, Ukrainian refugees who, who arrived to, to Russia, that is what's going on, uh, it's actually a mass deportation. We have no idea from these two uh, plus million people how many of them left their homes voluntarily and how many were uh, forcibly displaced, and not only the, the children, but also other people. So, and if we are, are uh, keeping our mind that uh, the Russian history of the last uh, centuries, mass deportation was always uh, an important tool uh, of uh, Russian authoritarian regimes. So, uh, and, and we mentioned Bucha and the Bucha massacre today. So, it's it's uh, it's likely it's another huge uh, uh, crime against humanity that how these Ukrainian people are forced to. Uh, go somewhere within uh, Russia, and I'm, I'm very, very skeptical of how these people can go back their home or Ukraine. I don't know from from uh, or very remote Siberian areas, for example. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for these presentations, and I think this whole conference is so important to all of us because we all are affected by this war. I'm Lithuanian, and I'm here for 30 years as professor at University of St. Joseph and president of BaltNet, which actually connects New England to Baltic states. And for us, as one of the neighbor, neighboring countries, it's very important when this war will end and how much of the damage we all will continue to get. All three presenters from this neighbor countries, you have a lot of experiences. And we have our own leaders that they already visited sites and they know what real life is over there. My question would be very simple. How can we predict what is gonna happen during this year? When we will end this war? And who is the main leader who can manage that? Europeans have probably own opinion. We have leaders who have our type of opinions, what do you think next step should be? To unite these people who have to unite together to restore that peace and to help these people that they are suffering over there. All generations are suffering. And of course, all the people are suffering. But most important, I think, to think about young people and children. They never experienced anything like this. And for us to see that, and to have this for a whole year, it's really difficult to, to continue to see and difficult even to think that we still don't see that end of the war. What would be next strategic step? I just want to know your opinion. Thank you, thank you. Do we have time? Maybe we will, uh, I see, m maybe, maybe we can ask other questions and then uh, answer to all of them. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, wanted to ask uh, His Excellency, Excellency Feruza uh, from Romania. 
I have uh, personally experienced part of, of Ukraine into Romania. And what we've seen and witnessed uh, was extreme efficiency in picking them up at the Palanca, Moldova border, taking them with the bus all the way to the Romanian border. And from there, the internal Romanian FEMA was t taking them and transporting them to other places inside the country. So I just wanted to praise UNHCR because they're two UN ambassadors here. And so take that feedback back. They're very efficient and they're, they're very good. Um, about Romania, what one distincting fe feature that I've seen Romania exhibit during this crisis was the way they welcomed third country nationals who were studying in Ukraine and who for some reason were, were rejected from the other countries, presumably because of the Schengen place um, prohibitions, but they found a way to come into Romania and not only that, could you comment on Romania's proactive efforts to go into Ukraine and pick up all these students from Africa and other places in buses and taking them into Romania for safety? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. My question is about the United Nations. Um, I thank the panelists, your excellencies, and all the participants for the individual country response and assistance that you have provided and continue to provide. We know that the United Nations recently voted in the General Assembly for Russia to withdraw their forces from Ukraine. This was a non-binding general resolution uh, we know it's not going to go anywhere because in the Security Council it'll be vetoed on, without a doubt. In fact, it's really mind-boggling that Russia is part of the Security Council uh, because the whole charter of the United Nations was created to prevent this kind of war. And, uh, and yet Russia is able to veto and veto and stymie any progress that the United Nations is trying to advance. So my question is about humanitarian aid and the extent of it from the United Nations. How does it work? Is it being coordinated with your individual governments? Is it done independently? Or maybe it's not being done much at all because of the power of the Soviet Union, uh, I'm sorry, Russia and, and China. China is always abstaining. They're not voting one way or another. But is the United Nations a player in this assistance for uh, refugees from Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you very much for this important question. Uh, another question. Yes, so this is related to the last question. Russia has, I believe, argued under Article 51 that they have the right to defend their country, their borders, as the rationale before the UN. But given that Russia is in violation of the charter of the UN, and it, that it was the Soviet Union, not the current Russian Federation, that was a founding member of the UN, why can't Russia be expulsed, thrown out of the United Nations for this fundamental violation of the UN Charter? Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Because it's uh, the final round, and I will give floor uh, to the panelists to answer. These are indeed very difficult questions, a technical one, but this is a panel of diplomats. They are ready to answer all questions. We start with the ambassador <laughs> to relate to United Nations, please. If, um, if answering the hard questions would solve the situation, there would be no problem. Um, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> everything that is happening is unprecedented. And, and you are very right, sir. The UN Charter was founded on the notion that no new world war should happen and avoiding the two world wars of the 20th century. And this is true. Russia is in breach of the UN Charter and its own obligations. Russia, Russia is in breach of its own responsibility as a permanent member of the Security Council. And that's why I think the answer from the international community was very clear. Um, 
including this week when we voted for the resolution, which is true, is non-binding, but it's the common message of the International Community that we are not able to tolerate such a behavior that will bring instability and would eliminate any predictability of the international security landscape. And that's the big challenge here. The more, it's, it's like that story when, when someone tells you that the system is wrong, we shouldn't simply say that let's change the system. Our answer to that is say, no, you are wrong. You are failing the system. And Russia has failed its own obligations. And that's countless of times, you know, that has been expressed in, in, in the General Assembly and Security Council yesterday, for example. We had many ministers from many countries around the world, not only permanent and elected members of Security Council, but also ministers from, uh, you know, Europe and Latin America and Africa as well. Uh, the Romanian Polish uh, foreign minister was there, the Polish foreign minister, the Hungarian foreign minister, they were in the Security Council. And I was telling to Foreign Minister Kuleba the day the resolution was adopted on Thursday. The number 141 is very significant. These are 141 responsible voices of the international committee that say that this is not possible and this is not tolerable. But I also told him that what is more important is the context and the spirit that accompanied that expression of um, you know, um, criticism towards Russia. There is a positive context within the international community that acknowledges quite clearly that the common answer to this is through common action. That also brings me to the point of the um, um, unity. Unity in, um, uh, among the European Union or NATO members, like-minded countries, the group of like-minded countries actually that is much bigger than the EU and NATO countries, I would say that we've never been so united. And that's probably the positive aspect that we can draw from that. What Russia and what Mr. Putin wanted to achieve did not happen, it's the opposite. And as we heard in the past, including in the past few weeks, including this week, um, we will remain united and support Ukraine defend itself. And that's the key difference between an aggressor and a country that it is defending itself. And of course, we in Romania will continue to put our voice and our efforts and our strength behind those efforts, you know, um, economically, politically, uh, financially, whatever it takes. We've been always saying that we, we stand by Ukraine. We stand and act as a responsible international actor, as you, you're mentioning about our support to third national um, students that were in Ukraine. At the beginning of the crisis, actually, we've been supporting 90 countries. And uh, we were um, in charge in, in Bucharest, 90 countries to expatriate their citizens and their students from Ukraine. And not only that we provided um, access to Ukrainian students to Romanian universities in the meantime, but also did the same for students from other countries, and we'll continue doing that. And the response of the international community in general has been quite coherent, including the UN, the UNHCR. We've been working with UNICEF. Um, the uh, International Organization for Migration is very active. The World Food Program, which is active in, in, in our countries as well, supporting uh, Ukraine. Um, the response that we managed to trigger at the international level, I would say, is, is very significant. And that's the way to continue ahead. When the war is going to be over, you're somehow alluded to that question. The war can end tomorrow. It's just up to Russia to withdraw, to cease the hostilities. And that's when the war will end. If that doesn't happen, the only option we have is continue to support Ukraine to defend itself. And the aggressors and the bullies should not be tolerated because that when this happens, we fail in our obligation to defend the UN Charter the principles and the international law. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, about the end of the war and uh, this UN issue of the Security Council, uh, Russia, blah, blah, blah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I visited many Med Middle East and African capitals in the last one year, right, dealing with uh, these topicals. And now we here are in a, let's say, a Ukrainian safe place. 
I think nobody in this room consider that uh, uh, Russia just did uh, uh, self-defense because NATO over exaggerated and wanted to endanger Moscow. But when we are visiting these capitals and speaking with diplomats, politicians, even the public, unfortunately many people and many leadership considers that they have that the West made mistakes and actually the the truth is with Russia. It's a horrible thing, but it's a fact. If you have a look uh, on the uh, recent vote in the, the General Assembly, now it, it was relatively good because uh, 140 countries supported uh, the, the resolution or draft resolution. But in general, if you have a look, uh, many countries uh, voted against it or abstained, very important countries. And this is the reason India of course, China, dozens of African countries and Arabic countries. And it's a very uh, important point why Russia can continue this war. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the time is against Ukraine and against the countries which are supporting Ukraine. Because after the failure of this blitzkrieg in the first weeks uh, of um, February and March last year. Actually, I uh, said so Putin realized that the regime change is not possible, of course, in Kiev. And what's going now in Ukraine to destroy the infrastructure, uh, destroy the houses, pushing people to leave the country within uh, the IDP or, 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 or leaving Ukraine, it's unfortunate, it's perfect for Mr. Putin. And this is the one, not million, but billion dollar question that how we can change this, this attitude. Of course, uh, uh, an excellent Ukraine offensive which could push out the, the Russian troops from the, the area of, and the territory of Ukraine, it, it would be excellent. But in the, the coming months, even with the arrival of the, the Leopard, M.A. Abrams, uh, M.A. Abrams main battle tanks, you know, it, uh, it's still unrealistic. And until, unfortunately, Russia can continue the war, we can see the, the numbers of the, the Ukrainian expert that Russia generating $1 billion daily from the revenues of oil and gas by spending, let's say, uh, $300 million for the war. So they can continue it. And ladies and gentlemen, what we, we see the, as the mobilization of the, the Russian forces uh, we still haven't mentioned uh, the, that Russia declared war, which would mean possible for Mr. Vladimir to, to mobilize millions of people. Now we're just speaking about hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers. We haven't mentioned still, beside Wagner Group, the possibility of mercenaries, thousands or tens of thousands of them. I don't know whether one of you have seen the, it was the news in May that in, in front of the Russian embassy in Addis Ababa, a huge line of people appeared because there was some misinformation that Russia is recruiting uh, people for the war against Ukraine. And this is why it's important that, that still many countries, unfortunately, with Russia in this conflict. Because if Mr. Putin wants manpower and he, he doesn't want to uh, a, a general mobilization in Ru within Russia, which can be a blow for the sentiments of the Russian population, we see that what happened in, the, the, in September when the, uh, the partial remobilization happened. You know, the, the third world will be happy to send tens of thousands of soldiers there also, unfortunately. Thank you very much. So at the end, you will have uh, also, you will understand the spectrum of opinions in the European Union, moderate pan Hungarian and hawkish pan Polish pan. Please, Council General, Thank you. your it's comment. A, it is a very tough po point to, to speak after such a realistic approach to the situation, but I think that this is the, the best value of, of our conversation here, that we have to be realistic to actually realize what are our opportunities and chances to uh, bring it, bring it uh, to, to the over. Starting from your point, I think uh, this is a task for all of us to kind of think of, uh, think outside of our Western free world bubble and start to talk and convince our countries. Uh, Russia spent a lot of money and a lot of effort 
recently uh, to convince countries of Africa, some countries of uh, of Middle East and Asia and, and S South America, yeah, at least to something what they successfully achieved to keep balance on the forest like UN uh, and others. Uh, and I think this is the task for us perhaps for another year to come to, to have these conversations with those leaders and those countries as well so they have understanding uh, where they should stand uh, in in this situation. The uh, the Polish answer to that very another easy question when this war is going to end, uh, our answer is quite simple. Since uh, this invasion was 100% uh, unjustified, uh, the only decision can be taken in Kiev by uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians people, and and this is only up to them. Uh, what are the um, uh, conditions under which they will call this uh, war the end. But frankly speaking, even um, a peace agreement signed tomorrow is not, um, uh, it doesn't guarantee that this will put end to uh, the stabilization of the region. Uh, each of such agreement has to be uh, enforced and unfortunately I think that this is project for years. Um, we are quite pessimistic in terms of how long it might take. Um, particularly that since Russia was not able to end this war within a couple of weeks as they originally planned, uh, I think that now they run war of exhaust exhaustion. They try to exhaust um, also the allies of Ukraine from continuing the help. Uh, so to the wonderful lady in white, um, um, I, I, this is a very dramatic question. We hear that all the time. How long shall, shall we keep being involved and how long it might take? Um, uh, our request to all American people is that please keep it up because this is really uh, this is really any withdrawal fro from helping Ukraine is something that plays directly to the hands of Putin and, and Russia. Um, to the refugees, uh, just wanted to make one point. I think it's important that Poland never made a factor um, uh, of, of nationality uh, in the process of acceptance refugees into Poland. So whatever kind of appeared maybe in the media sphere, there, there was a lot of Russian propaganda as well uh, to it. Uh, we accepted people of all uh, nationalities uh, who are trying to cross border under the general international refugee law. This is important to, to, to point it out. And we will keep on doing that, hopefully, uh, as a community, with all the voices. I think NATO is a great example. You know that we have our arguments. Some of countries of NATO have different perspectives on Russia, but eventually we are able to take decisions. Um, promptly and timely enough to provide Ukraine with help they need and we will continue to have those conversations even if, if we, we disagree on, on some of the matters. I think that this is the beauty of, of democracy and, and that our values that we try to protect and we try to give a chance um, uh, for Ukrainians to self-determine. They have every right to self-determine whether they want to be a part of free world, part of the values that we cherish or whether they want to go some, some other direction. They, they were vocal, so we should all help them. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to Thank you. speak to this panel. Final word, uh, Ambassador, please. J just 20 seconds, because I, I don't want us to, to end this session on a downbeat you know, uh, mood. First and foremost, sanctions work. They do work. We see that, we know that, we have evidence of that. So the, all of the packages that the European Union has taken and the US and other like-minded countries, they have hit the Russian economy. A second point, I, I would say that the resolution in the General Assembly and the action in the UN should not be underestimated. And when, whenever there, there is, you know, um, a narrative that Russia has been provoked into that. We should counter that. This is the result of the Russian disinformation and misinformation. The, and the last point, I would say that the only mistake that we in Europe did was not to take Russia seriously earlier. Poland did, Romania did, Hungary did, other countries did. And it started with Georgia in 2008. Um, that's the only mistake. But what is happening now, all of us being more united than ever and take an action and stance against Russia is the right approach and we should continue along this path. Thank you.
Thank you. I, I would like to say a special thanks to everyone on our panel. They didn't need to s travel to come here. The, we have two gentlemen who came up from New York City. Um, Victor came up from Washington, D.C., and Mr. Chapotovich came over from Poland. So we would like to really thank you all for taking time to be with us today.